everybody to log on. We'll take a minute or two. I saw different people have sort of uh, different backgrounds they use for their talks. Uh, mine doesn't have anything China related, so I feel slightly bad about that, but otherwise I think it's fine. Realism is good. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I didn't, I'm not forcing anything China related. Of course I live in a, you know, a China palace with you know, scrolls behind me and you know, Mao posters, no. Okay, well, I want to welcome everyone to the Critical Issues Concerning China Lecture Series at the Fairbanks Center for Chinese Studies at Harvard. Um, this will be our penultimate lecture this year. Um, uh, the last will be, <clears throat> excuse me, at the very end of the month when Bert Hoffman um, from Singapore will be speaking on um, Wednesday, uh, April 27th at 9 a.m because of the time difference between Singapore and Cambridge. But in the meantime, um, I'm Nara Dillon and I teach in the government department at Harvard. And I'm very welcome, uh, very happy to be able to welcome Chris Carruthers back to the Fairbanks Center to give us his talk today on corruption in China and East Asia. Chris Carruthers got his PhD here in political science um, and then has gone on to do a postdoctoral fellowship at Penn. And he's put this, uh, the pandemic to good use and has uh, managed to turn his dissertation research into a book already that has just come out. Um, and so the new book is called Corruption Control in Authoritarian Regimes, Lessons from East Asia. And I think it just came out last week so we can all run out and buy it. And so I wanna turn it over to Chris here and uh, you can speak for about half an hour, 40 minutes, and then we'll open it up to um, Q and A. Everyone in the audience can submit their questions through the Q and A box um, down at the bottom of the screen. And, uh, and then we will take these questions and uh, lead them, uh, lead a discussion at the end of this. Thank you so much. I, uh, I'm really glad to be back. It's really great to be invited even virtually to, to Harvard again. Uh, it's been three long years and uh, a lot of it has been uh, turning this dissertation into a book. So I'm also very glad that the book is finished. Um, yes, uh, let me go ahead and share a screen. I'll get started with my talk. Okay, so hi everyone, thank you for coming. Uh, my name is Chris Carruthers. I'm a postdoctoral fellow at UPenn's Center for the Study of Contemporary China. And my talk today is entitled, When Autocrats Clean House, Xi Jinping's Campaign and Its Consequences. Now this talk is based on my book just mentioned in that wonderful introduction by Nara. Uh, corruption Control and Authoritarian Regimes Lessons from East Asia. It is indeed just out last week. I, you don't need this, but I just got my first hard copies. So this is real. Uh, please check this out if you're interested. All right. Now government corruption, when it becomes widespread is well known to have a host of negative effects. Corruption weakens governance and it undermines how the state functions. It hampers economic growth and creates economic inequality and distortions. And moreover, instances of high profile bribery and embezzlement 
are well known to anger public opinion, and they threaten the political legitimacy of governments, sometimes leading to leaders falling or entire governments being toppled. And all this is true, not just for democracies, which are accountable to their citizens, but also for authoritarian regimes. Chinese President Xi Jinping, when he took power 10 years ago, uh, frankly assessed the problem of corruption. He said that a mass of facts tells us that if corruption becomes increasingly serious, it will inevitably doom the party and the state. We must be vigilant. So in a regime that is often tooting its own horn and talking only about its successes, this was a strong admission that corruption has costs and that the costs of corruption are being felt by the Chinese regime. Despite, despite that, despite all of these costs that corruption can bring and all these negatives, the conventional wisdom uh, among many scholars and observers of authoritarian governments and non-democratic forms of, of government are, is that for autocrats, the benefits of corruption far outweigh the potential costs. Autocrats love corruption. Authoritarian regimes are very corrupt. Past work in particular notes that autocrats use corruption not only to enrich themselves, of course, buying fancy things, but, but also, and this is the key, to maintain their rule. So many autocrats use corruption strategically by distributing spoils to certain elites or certain special interests who in return support them. And while the public suffers, well, dictators aren't accountable to the public. And this is why in the highly influential book, The Dictator's Handbook, uh, which came out about 10 years ago now, it's argued, as the subtitle there suggests, that bad behavior, such as corruption, is almost always good politics for authoritarian regimes. So uh, autocrats love corruption, they use corruption, and it frankly benefits them politically in many cases. Sometimes they say, like Xi Jinping said, that, that they're gonna curb corruption. But you can't trust this, is the view among many, uh, because anti-corruption is actually about autocrats purging rivals and consolidating their power, right? We know of many cases where autocrats say they're going to clean house, and what they do is they just accuse some other elites in their system of being corrupt and then use those accusations to get rid of them, and then they don't undertake systemic reforms. So, this is one conventional wisdom. And, and there's a related conventional wisdom here that's about how you would curb corruption, right? So autocrats are benefiting from corruption and they're, they're also not likely to curb corruption because in order to curb corruption, strong democratic essential, institutions are essential, right? So in corruption studies, many studies show that the rule of law, competitive elections, checks and balances, public oversight from civil society and other mechanisms like this constrain power and create accountability. And that is how you really curb corruption, okay? And, and autocrats, of course, reject these democratic features. Autocrats don't want their power to be challenged. They don't want checks and balances. And they're not going to accept scenes like the one here, uh, which is from South Korea. And what it's showing is the massive candlelight protests, candlelight demonstrations that South Koreans uh, undertook in late 2016, early 2017, to protest the corruption of their president, Park geun -hye. And through these protests, they eventually toppled the president. So this is how anti-corruption is supposed to work in a democracy, and this is the best practices. So for all these reasons, it seems very unlikely that we would expect autocrats to really crack down on corruption substantively. However, despite that conventional wisdom, I, I, I began to find in my research that, that substantial anti-corruption efforts by authoritarian regimes are more common and, and more often successful than is widely assumed. So my research shows that there have been dozens of national level anti-corruption efforts in recent decades including at least 10 cases in which I identify reforms as having been successful in substantively curbing corruption. Uh, to give you an example of some of those, I have uh, put up some here. 
you can see that there are all kinds of different authoritarian regimes that have at different times tried to curb corruption. Uh, and that includes regimes that are military and non-military, communist and anti-communist, and authoritarian regimes in many different regions of the world. Um, probably the best known case here is that of Singapore. I think many observers believe that Singapore under Lee Kuan Yew was a surprising, a unique example of an authoritarian leader cracking down on corruption and really changing the, the nature of a regime. And that is part of what has driven Singapore's success and part of what has made Singapore so appealing to foreign investors as an economy over the last uh, 70 years. But what I'm trying to suggest here is that this phenomenon of authoritarian anti-corruption is really much more than just a Singaporean fluke. It's a broad thing that needs to be understood and examined. Um, so in this talk, I'm going to focus on Xi Jinping's massive anti-corruption campaign that he launched as soon as he came into power, just after making uh, that speech in which he identified corruption as a major threat to the future of uh, his party and his government. I'm going to talk about the motives for Xi's campaign, the outcomes, the methods by which she achieved those outcomes, and then the broader implications for our understanding of China. Uh, then I'm going to briefly turn to a comparative perspective and talk about authoritarian anti-corruption in other countries. And then I'm going to make some broader conclusions and maybe make some provocations and hope to say enough to inspire a great discussion. Okay. My main arguments are as follows. The first, over the last decade, Xi's campaign has succeeded in reducing, though not eliminating, corruption. And that's a very simple statement, but I think it's an important point to make because it's very contestable and it has a lot of consequences. Secondly, I argue that she has succeeded not through greater democracy, as we might expect, not if we were to expect anti-corruption to succeed through the imposition of checks and balances or some kind of constraints on executive power, but rather through a decidedly authoritarian approach to corruption control. So she's campaign has succeeded and it succeeded in a particular way. Uh, let me step back now and introduce this campaign and go through its different parts. So Xi Jinping's anti-corruption campaign was very much the signature domestic policy in his first term and afterwards. This was the, uh, the really the policy domestically, at least most associated with the new leader. And this campaign was initially doubted by many observers, but it, it grew and it grew and it came eventually to affect every province, every government bureau, and every economic sector in, in, in very complex ways. And the, comp the, the, the complexity doesn't just stop at the geographical level, it's really complex over time as well. The campaign has evolved in different phases of enforcement, right? The campaign uh, initially focused on state-owned enterprises, but then at other times, it shifted to focus on military corruption. And then it was corruption focused on, uh, focusing on curbing corruption, in the Belt and Road Initiative. So this campaign is, is far reaching and has been very complex and remains ongoing in some form today, 10 years later. Uh, so what motivated this campaign? Well, from the beginning, there have been many analysts who have had a obviously skeptical perspective. And this makes a lot of sense when we know that many other autocrats say they're gonna curb corruption and then they don't really mean it. They, what they really mean is they're gonna purge some rivals or they're gonna do something else that's not really related to corruption. So the skeptical perspective, if I can characterize it simply, I think is that this campaign is some mix of Xi Jinping purging political rivals, a complex factional struggle within the Chinese Communist Party and a kind of, um, theater put on for the Chinese public. Many Chinese citizens have expressed their discontent at corruption. Well, so let's give them a big show. Let's arrest some high level elites for corruption. Let's knock some heads together, reveal some cases of bribery, and then we'll all go home. And so this perspective suggests various motivations that of course would not 
lead to actually curbing corruption. However, uh, I want to speak against this skeptical perspective. I think that purging rivals and broader reforms are not mutually exclusive. So she has indeed used this campaign to strengthen his political position, but he's also used it in broader ways to curb corruption. Uh, power consolidation as a motive does not really explain the campaign's length, it's lasted 10 years, its scope, the way it's affected uh, the whole country, and its complexity. And there's a lot of this campaign that doesn't fit into simple narratives and isn't just about uh, something that can be used for foreign propaganda. Moreover, I think that most experts who've looked carefully at this campaign would at least accept that curbing corruption is one of its main goals, that while the campaign is not just about corruption, the campaign has that as a main feature. Uh, so how would I characterize the motivations for this campaign? I think that she has sought to curb corruption as part of his overarching mission to strengthen CCP discipline and organization. Now, this is no mystery. This is something that the Xi administration has repeatedly said, that curbing corruption will strengthen the party's discipline and organization, and that that is a critical task, which they have also pursued in many other areas. So this makes sense, uh, not only if we accept propaganda, but also if we accept that many different things that the Xi administration has done fit together into a cohesive overarching vision for Xi's governance. Um, and why would she have this desire to strengthen party discipline and organization? Well, we could argue he's a party man, but I think that the deeper reason is that anti-corruption helps to address what was seen by Xi and by many leaders as a looming governance crisis in the late 2000s before she took power. There was ineffective leadership under the former President Hu Jintao, there was rising public discontent about corruption, but also about inequality and about environmental issues and other issues. And there was this sense among the party that there had become uh, too, it, it, that, that excessive liberalism had taken hold and that uh, the internet was allowing too many people to voice too many opinions and that this was potentially a danger to the party's ability to control the country properly. And all of these things coming together like this in the late 2000s were suggestive to Xi and to other leaders of his worst fear, which is the Soviet style collapse of the Chinese Communist Party. So the Soviet Union in the 1980s was experiencing many of these issues coming together in a similar way, at least according to Chinese analyses of why the Soviet Union fell. So of course, if, if curbing corruption can help strengthen the party, and if strengthening the party can help keep the regime in power, then it makes a lot of sense that curbing corruption is an essential task for the Xi administration. Uh, so has this anti-corruption push worked? Well, I think that question really raises the question of how we know if anti-corruption works in any particular case. Uh, scholars, of course, can't see corruption directly. They can't measure the amount of corruption. Uh, so they've taken different kinds of approaches to assessing anti-corruption in the past. One very common way is to rely on perceptions, perceptions as a proxy for the amount of actual corruption. And according to perception indices, Xi Jinping's campaign has not succeeded. Uh, here is the Transparency International's well-known and widely used corruption perceptions index, uh, six full years into Xi's campaign, and it shows that uh, Xi's campaign has had no effect, seemingly, on the amount of corruption that China is perceived to have. Um, and so that would seem to be a strong mark against this campaign. However, I think that perceptions are really not a good metric for this study and particularly for understanding Xi Jinping's campaign. The, for one thing, the distance between perceptions and actual corruption, which is always an issue, is likely to be much greater in opaque authoritarian regimes. When these perception indices interview foreign investors about how corrupt they perceive China to be, these these perceptions are based on a very limited 
uh, amount of information that may pertain only to a particular industry or to the particular investments made by one person. Uh, and they, they don't capture the huge complex domestic reality of China, which is partly on purpose because authoritarian regimes are not very transparent. Uh, secondly, perceptions only indirectly tell us what the government has actually done or, or tried to do or achieved or didn't achieve. Um, it's often the case that uh, foreign perception is shaped by not what the government is doing, but what the government is doing in other areas. So Xi Jinping's administration has been cracking down on minorities and has been uh, highly illiberal in many ways that have worried and angered uh, foreign observers, especially in Western countries where these kinds of surveys are most often conducted. And that negative perception of the Xi administration is highly likely to shape how corrupt it's seen as, even though corruption and authoritarianism are conceptually different things. Uh, so it's best not to conflate authoritarianism with corruption because corruption can vary quite a lot, even as authoritarianism varies uh, uh, differently. Uh, and finally, the Transparency International's Corruption Perception Index methodology has been criticized on many different grounds as being very imprecise and being mostly useful for large end research, but much less helpful when we're really digging into one particular case like we should here. Okay, that's a long explanation of why I don't think we should just rely on perceptions. Uh, instead, I suggest that we should look at what the campaign has actually done, and, 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 and we should focus on two key questions. First, did the campaign enforce anti-corruption through wide-ranging investigations and prosecutions? So that's anti-corruption enforcement, and that's, that's very important to have. But even more important is the second part. Did this campaign build up institutional constraints on corruption? such as through new rulemaking and organizational reforms. So these together kind of capture what anti-corruption really is, which is uh, actually enforcing rules and then building up institutions, including laws, rules, and organizations that constrain corruption. Together, enforcement and rulemaking need to both be there for a campaign to be successful. And that's what's missing in many autocrats' uh, attempts to curb corruption or fake attempts to curb corruption where they're actually just purging rivals. Uh, so how would I score Xi's campaign on that basis? Well, let's look first at enforcement. So enforcement has several features that are very strong. So obviously this campaign has had a very broad scope. It has investigated more than 3 million people across all provinces, bureaus, and economic sectors. And immediately that tells us that the campaign is not just targeted at a few political enemies, and it's not just targeted at one rogue province or, or to enforce one particular agenda. Secondly, the campaign has had amazing vertical reach. It's disciplined more than 300 high-ranking officials, including some from every province and major city, uh, 70 heads of important state-run enterprises, and 63 generals. I believe that 63 generals is just in Xi's first term. So, so this isn't just a low level purge, it's something that goes across the board vertically as well as horizontally. And lastly, there's been very strong persistence. There's been little backtracking on the campaign with conviction rates over 99%. Uh, the campaign is also unprecedentedly long. So it's very different than a campaign that doesn't have persistence, such as uh, Mohammed bin Salman's case in Saudi Arabia, where he arrested some officials for corruption a few years ago, but then just kind of let them go. Uh, so this is not that. Xi Jinping's campaign stands above, in various ways, other uh, anti-corruption efforts by autocrats. Uh, and if we turn to rulemaking, we see that Xi's campaign has had much more depth than previous campaigns in recent decades in China. Uh, the anti-corruption apparatus has been dramatically strengthened uh, for this campaign. So first, she strengthened the Central Commission for Discipline Inspection, and he strengthened the inspection system separately from that. And he established the powerful National Supervision Commission, which addresses corruption even more broadly. Uh, he also led, in his administration, led reforms of party and government practices in many areas that have changed how government works. So there's wide ranging evidence from economic studies that uh, cadre behavior 
in terms of land transactions, in terms of luxury imports, in terms of car sales, in terms of real estate transactions. Uh, it's really changed dramatically since the campaign began in ways that suggest that officials are restraining themselves and acting differently than before. So I think that's indication that these rules are not only put into place, but have continued to be enforced over this past decade. And lastly, if we just look at anti-corruption rules in particular, the Xi administration has enacted and enforced many kinds of new anti-corruption rules, including uh, the eight-point code, which is a party behavior code that shapes how uh, party members are supposed to behave, and, and other laws and regulations. And we can see these being enforced not just briefly for a short time, but, but really over the long haul over the last 10 years. And so it's time to accept that Xi's campaign in terms of both enforcement and rulemaking has uh, had major success. Um, on the other hand, I think there are real limitations to this campaign. We shouldn't overstate the, the effect on corruption because corruption continues in China, of course. And, and I think the biggest hole in the campaign is very connected to its authoritarian nature. It's that the reforms have not addressed elite corruption. The campaign has failed to systematically enforce reforms that could address corrupt practices among well-connected elites. The kind of uh, insider trading and uh, self-dealing that we see so vividly portrayed in Desmond Shum's book, Red Roulette, although Shum is actually recounting events that happened prior to uh, Xi coming to power and prior to the anti-corruption campaign. But overall, my verdict is that Xi's campaign has been successful in limiting government corruption. Um, but, but how has the Xi administration done that? Well, skeptics contend that China needs to use more democratic methods to address corruption and adhere to best practices, and that uh, true corruption would require breaking the CCP's monopoly on power. So there's, there's no way Xi's campaign can succeed because it, it doesn't fit our model of how we understand anti-corruption. Uh, this is Min Xinpei's excellent book, China's Crony Capitalism, which makes the case that corruption is becoming uh, so entrenched in China that there's really no way to fix it within the current administration or the current regime. So that ultimately spells the downfall of the party in, in Min Xinpei's view. Um, however, what I found is that the Xi administration has succeeded through a decidedly authoritarian approach to corruption control. And what do I mean by an authoritarian approach? Well, I think it has several features. Firstly, there's been tremendous power centralization in the campaign. So there's been consolidated control of the campaign by Xi personally and by institutions directly loyal to him. So there's so much uh, talk of Xi's instructions, Xi's leadership, uh, Xi's particular ideas for reform in the campaign and people are studying Xi's uh, uh, instructions for the campaign. And uh, this directly contradicts the idea of checks and balances and for example, in judicial independence that you would want theoretically in an anti-corruption campaign, but it's been done in a centralized way. Uh, secondly, it's been done in a top-down way. Top-down control has been at the center of this campaign. So that means that on the plus side, the campaign can cut through local protectionism and bureaucratic resistance and lower level governments that might try to resist anti-corruption. But it goes directly against what we would think of as good corruption control in a democratic context because civil society is shut out of anti-corruption work. So citizen groups that protest uh, corrupt officials are suppressed even as the regime uh, uses its top-down uh, abilities to go after corrupt officials. And, and lastly, this campaign has involved a tremendous amount of censorship and propaganda. So it's censoring certain things and it's advancing other things through propaganda. There's been overall a coordinated media strategy, I think, to sell the campaign as necessary, as inevitable, and as evidence of CCP's leadership, right? Only the CCP, only the government currently in power can curb corruption is very much the message of this campaign. And popular TV dramas have helped to support that message, sometimes created in 
collaboration with government agencies. Uh, for example, in the name of the people and always on the road. Um, actually, always on the road is a documentary. But so here are some uh, scenes from the very dramatic anti-corruption TV that uh, has uh, become popular in China and that uh, really has raised the quality of uh, government propaganda, I think, by mixing it with real high quality acting and drama and uh, portraying a certain narrative that is helpful to, to the government. Often when we talk about Xi's campaign, the question is how Maoist it is. So it's authoritarian, but how Maoist in particular is Xi's campaign? Xi has overall in his uh, uh, term invited many comparisons to Chairman Mao. And that's because he is personally consolidated power, because he has a party first agenda, because he engages in ideological and anti-Western rhetoric, and because of his wide ranging crackdown on dissent throughout the country, both in the minority regions and uh, more generally. So in that context, is this campaign a kind of Maoist campaign? Uh, I think yes and no. Um, Xi's campaign, like much of his governance, draws on Maoist features, but it does so selectively. And, and I think it adapts them to new conditions. Um, there, there are really some, some big differences between Mao era campaigns and Xi's campaign. The first is that there's no real mass mobilization in Xi's campaign. So Mao was a great believer in the power of the people, the power of the masses rising up and challenging uh, illegitimate authority. But every Chinese leader since the Cultural Revolution has been rightly fearful of actually, uh, actually allowing the masses to take power. And Xi's campaign may sound red, it may sing red songs and have rhetoric of the people uh, defeating corruption, but really it is, as I said, top down and highly controlled. And so that's a major difference. Secondly, uh, Xi's campaign is very professional and expert led. So Mao was not a believer in experts. Mao believed in people power and, and he wanted citizen activists to take the lead in anti-corruption. But China's economy has grown very complex and actually its political system has also grown more complex. And that just wouldn't necessarily work today. Xi instead has organized his anti-corruption campaign in a way that uh, brings in real expertise from many different fields, legal, financial, uh, and, and ideological. And when inspectors are dispatched to inspect a city in China to see how uh, it's handling its anti-corruption, they are highly experienced inspectors with uh, expertise in different fields, maybe in auditing, and they're definitely not citizen activists. So that's another sort of big difference to this campaign. And finally, uh, I think it's really interesting that this campaign under Xi has no end point. See, Mao had campaigns that were uh, like a brief storm. They would come and they would shake things up and they would uh, sweep through the country, but then they would end. They would end and things would go back to normal, uh, hopefully with some improvements in different areas, but, but generally they would end. Whereas Xi's campaign uh, uh, st uh, statedly has no end point. So Xi is trying to achieve a new normal of high pressure uh, enforcement against corruption. And so far, I think that that seems to be the direction this campaign is going. I don't see this campaign ending as long as she remains in power. And even if another leader takes over, that doesn't mean that they would roll back all of the different measures and organization building that she has done. Um, so what? So what are the larger political implications of what I've said so far? So what if Xi's campaign has curbed corruption and has done so with authoritarian methods? Well, I think there are several points worth raising. First is that this suggests that Xi is succeeding in strengthening party organization and discipline. Uh, this campaign helps Xi expand party control over the state and society 
and, and helps him roll back the political liberalization that occurred under his predecessors, Jiang Zemin and Hu Jintao. Um, from a political science standpoint, the ability of a regime to reform itself is very positive in terms of signaling that it's flexible and durable. So if Xi's regime is able to address corruption, this new challenge that arose in a particular period, or not entirely new, of course, but, but that was rising in the 2000s and make serious headway against it, then that shows that the regime uh, isn't just living on borrowed time, isn't just hearkening back to its glorious past, but actually uh, has ways to move forward into the future. And, and that leads to the last point, which is that there may be no contradiction in the short or medium term between greater authoritarianism in China and greater regime strength, right? Sometimes it's assumed that if a regime gets too centralized or too authoritarian, it actually becomes brittle and then it's likely to fall. But this kind of flexibility and durability uh, seems to not be headed in that direction. So uh, those are some of the larger political implications of this campaign. Um, if we just turn briefly to authoritarian anti-corruption elsewhere, uh, I want to talk about how Xi's campaign fits into the broader authoritarian world. This is uh, Rwandan President Paul Kagame, who since uh, coming to power in 1999 has forcefully pushed anti-corruption as one of his uh, signature policies. He has argued that Rwanda should be Africa's Singapore and that curbing corruption uh, means that he's doing a good job and is legitimate and that Rwanda uh, can be a leader in Africa. So here is a long list of different anti-corruption efforts that I've identified chronologically, and you don't need to memorize this at all, uh, but I'm just showing, or even read it all, but I'm just showing you that there's really a variety of different uh, regimes that have at different points for different reasons, realized that corruption is a problem and tried to address it. And most of the time, these anti-corruption efforts are not successful, as we would assume, uh, but sometimes leaders have the right motivation and they have the right incentives and uh, they also are strong enough to really bring substantive reform. And I think that as in the case of Xi's campaign, when other leaders have successfully curbed corruption, such as Paul Kagame, I would argue, they have strengthened their regime and they have made the case that their regime can last into the 21st century when people are demanding less corruption and that, that their regimes have futures. Um, I mean, the book, I, I don't talk about all of these different cases. I really focus on nine main cases of anti-corruption efforts in China, Taiwan and South Korea uh, over various decades. So in China, I compare Xi's campaign to Mao era campaigns such as the three antis, five antis and the four cleans campaign in the 1960s and also the post Tiananmen Square crackdown where uh, the party uh, attacked corruption uh, by arresting a huge number of allegedly corrupt officials after putting down the Tiananmen Square protests and saying, look, see, we're, we're doing what you want. Uh, the Tiananmen Square protests were uh, calling for less corruption and democracy. Well, okay, we'll give you less corruption. How about that? And uh, there was this attempt to persuade the public by arresting a lot of people. And that gets to enforcement that I talked about enforcement and rulemaking, but there was almost no rulemaking in the sense of institutional follow through. And so this campaign compared to Xi's was very weak and was really more political theater than uh, the substantive reforms that we've seen over the last 10 years, I would argue. Um, I also have other analyses of why campaigns in Taiwan and South Korea have succeeded or failed at different times and what that meant for those regimes before they democratized. Uh, in the book overall, I conduct a lot of research in uh, China, South Korea, and Taiwan. Uh, I use a lot of Chinese and Korean language archival materials uh, from those countries and also from here in the United States. And I conducted interviews, uh, including of scholars with expertise on corruption and politics, 
and uh, high-level officials, current and former anti-corruption investigators, prosecutors, journalists, NGO activists. Uh, all of this was much, much more difficult in China than in South Korea and Taiwan. Uh, so I would say that my analysis of Xi's campaign is really based uh, primarily on data and on evidence that's uh, open source, openly available, and on analyzing that evidence holistically rather than any special access to officials, which I certainly don't claim to have. Uh, here are some of those sources that I used in my book to investigate anti-corruption in China, South Korea, and Taiwan. Uh, you can see at the bottom there in red, Chiang Kai-shek's scrawling handwriting. He's writing that corruption and discord ruined the nation, meaning lost him China. Uh, Okay, so let's review the main points here. I think the biggest takeaway is that we should take authoritarian anti-corruption seriously. Autocrats, despite not being accountable, despite not having democratic institutions, they have incentives and sometimes the ability to reduce corruption. Uh, Xi's campaign is a strong example of that and it has implications for our understanding of China today. His sweeping campaign enhanced anti-corruption enforcement and rulemaking in ways that directly curb government wrongdoing and change the behavior of officials. And she has succeeded through a top-down authoritarian approach to corruption control, showing that anti-corruption isn't always leading to democracy or to democratization. Uh, moreover, uh, corruption control has likely strengthened Xi's regime by improving party discipline, and of course, by addressing a major source of public discontent. Uh, I have, various articles, uh, related research that I've done on uh, this topic. I could just point, I'll point you to briefly in uh, taking authoritarian anti-corruption reform seriously, this uh, aptly titled article, I take on Xi's campaign and uh, really show it as a case study of authoritarian anti-corruption, somewhat like I've done with this talk today. In the autocrat's corruption dilemma, I make a sort of theoretical point about the, the dilemma between the pros and cons of engaging in corruption, the benefits that autocrats get from corruption, but also the potential costs and risks of corruption. Um, in a third piece, I look at uh, the use of inspections in Xi's China, especially the Xun Shizu, and how this inspection system that isn't widely understood is important, not only for corruption control, but also for extending the top-down control that the Xi administration wants over the whole country. Um, in another piece, I look at uh, anti-corruption in North Korea and make some comparisons to China. And then in a final piece, I look at Xi's campaign in the second term of Xi's governance. So I look at how the campaign has done more than just focused on corruption and how it's expanded in other ways over the last, just the last few years. So if you're at all interested in this topic, please check out those as well as my book. Um, I wanna leave you with a few final thoughts. Uh, a lot of what I've said today would seem to be in praise of Xi Jinping and his ability to curb corruption, but that's really not my purpose here. This study is not seeking to praise autocracies but rather to understand them, understand their capacities so that we as researchers don't underestimate them. Um, my analysis does not negate the fact that most autocrats are not reformers and, and even those that are oppress their citizens to achieve their goals. Uh, so Xi Jinping is waging anti-corruption for his reasons on his terms and not uh, because of the public's desires for cleaner government and not in the ways the public would necessarily want. And I think we can draw parallels between that and um, other, other major tasks the Chinese government has undertaken, such as its current fight against COVID-19. Um, finally, even though I'm saying that corruption control has been successful under Xi Jinping's govern government, I'm not ruling out here that in some future democratic China, uh, corruption control might be even stronger. I think that uh, China has very high state capacity. Its, its state apparatus is very strong and that's a legacy uh, both of uh, early state formation in China and of more recent changes under the Communist Party and China becoming increasingly wealthy. These things suggest that uh, corruption control could work just as well or better in a democratic system. And it would certainly be fairer 
more inclusive and more just. So those are just some final thoughts I wanted to leave you with. So thank you so much for coming to my talk. I really appreciate it. I hope we can have an interesting discussion now. Thank you. Great, thank you, Chris, for a fascinating talk. And uh, we've got lots of questions coming in, but I wanted to start off and take the chair's prerogative to ask you uh, a question of my own. Oops. Your cases um, immediately bring to mind the developmental state model and Chalmers Johnson's argument that um, you really need to limit the collusion between political and economic elites if you're going to achieve high growth and to sustain it over time. So it really struck me that the one area where you thought this campaign, Xi Jinping's campaign, had not had an effect was precisely on these kinds of connections between political and economic elites. So I just wanted to ask you what you thought about the implications of this are for China's continued economic growth and also what you think about those uh, developmental state arguments. Um, does your analysis fit within those frameworks or um, do you differ from, from that argument? Great, uh, thank you for that question. That's absolutely right. I, I didn't use the term developmental state in, in my talk today, but that's at the heart of how I began to think about this topic because when we look back at the period of developmental states in East Asia in the second half of the 20th century, uh, a story has been told about the need to uh, sort of limit corruption, but it hasn't, it hasn't been brought out as much as it should have been. Anti-corruption campaigns, I find, were, were part of uh, every developmental state in, in East Asia, uh, helping to create those conditions by which the state is not open to too much external influence and therefore can mobilize resources in the way that it wants to, to achieve uh, top-down goals. And so that what I'm arguing is in line with that model. Um, but as economists know, that is not a permanent phase of economic development. So there's a phase of economic development that requires this uh, top-down mobilization, perhaps to achieve industrialization or uh, major recovery from uh, war, but then the economy changes and it has different requirements. And, and uh, what China is facing today is an economy that can no longer be boosted by just huge growth investments. They need efficiency gains. The, the economist Arthur Krober argued that in, in the early 2000s, China switched from needing more input to needing more efficiency. And I think the leadership has become aware of that, of course. And so more efficiency gains requires uh, corruption control, just as the developmental state did. It requires reduced corruption so that uh, money isn't lost for uh, misallocated purposes. When things are growing at 10%, you can misallocate a lot of money. But when things are growing at 4%, you need to, to reduce corruption even further to achieve high quality growth. And so I think part of the motivation for anti-corruption is that she is aware that this needs to be done for, for further economic growth. Although if economic growth alone were a motivation, uh, we would see every, every government in the world uh, needing to, to, to curb corruption. So it has, to, it has to be under certain conditions, but certainly um, my study is, uh, I think, a positive uh, sign for uh, she's plans to curb corruption and therefore uh, to, to support the economy. Some people would really disagree with that. You know, some people would argue that uh, Xi's campaign is so restrictive that it makes officials be unable to do their jobs. And so therefore it's actually gonna scare the economy into stagnation. And there's gonna, there's just gonna be paralysis because of the high pressure anti-corruption campaign. I actually don't agree with that. I think that uh, I'm not an economist, but um, I historically we see this argument with every single anti-corruption campaign. And it, um, it just isn't fully persuasive that officials have just been standing still for the past 10 years because China has continued to grow. And the, the campaign has gone on long enough now that if it were going to cause total paralysis, it would have. In fact, causing officials not to 
make huge, corrupt, inefficient investments is probably a good thing. Some restraint is probably a good thing on the economy. Uh, so I think that even though that is a real phenomenon, I think we shouldn't overstate it. And no matter what, China needs to reduce corruption. That, that is agreed on. So no matter the cost, uh, it, needs, it needs to happen for, for growth and for other reasons. Well, great. Well, I'll take some questions from the audience now. So Fairbanks Center Director Michael Sony um, has a question for you. He says, thanks for a terrific talk. Your comment that the campaign has no, you comment that the campaign has no endpoint. Intuitively, there's an obvious potential endpoint, the end of corruption. So by not highlighting this endpoint, the campaign seems to suggest a rec recognition by the CCP that corruption is perennial in China. If my logic is correct, what does this recognition tell us about the CCP perception of its own authority today and in the future? That's a very interesting question. Um, I think that's right. One reason the campaign cannot end is because then any corruption that would occur after that would prove that it had not fully succeeded. Um, I think that part of what this means uh, is that the CCP is positioning itself as the legitimate force that will combat a perennial scourge. So corruption will always be with us like other problems and it will reoccur. And as the economy changes, new forms of corruption will emerge and, and, and uh, transformation will uh, bring in other challenges and new foreign trade will bring corruption related challenges and people's standards for what's corrupt may change but the CCP will always be in your corner and we will just keep fighting corruption and keep changing and improving our anti-corruption system. And, and that makes us legitimate. And that, that ability to deliver for the Chinese people is, is what makes us legitimate. And so I think that that's the move that the Xi administration is making by having a never ending campaign. So perennial corruption and perennial anti-corruption. <laughs> just, just keep the lid on it. Just, just keep it to a certain level and keep below. On the other, I mean, some people might also say you don't actually want zero corruption. Or that's not a really an attainable goal, even in Norway or anywhere, because uh, corruption can be a grease that helps things function when rules are too bureaucratic and it helps people get around problems. And, and so zero corruption would be too costly and would be unattainable in, in any case. Uh, I think that's that's true. Uh, also, what I said is true that things keep changing. And so there might be low corruption for a period of time, but even in democracies, even in some of the cleanest democracies, new issues emerge as politics and economics continue to change. Okay, well, a good follow on to that question comes from Tom Gold at UC Berkeley. Oh, hi, hi, Tom. And he asked, can we say that China has oligarchs um, in the sense that post-Soviet um, Russia has uh, oligarchs? Great question. Um, I think that we should, we should separate out two things. China certainly has oligarchs in the sense of very powerful, wealthy people, right? The number of billionaires in China is skyrocketing, but these oligarchs are very different in their political functions in Russia and in China. So in Russia, Putin really does rule sort of primarily through corrupt exchanges, through the funneling of the state's resources to a small group of friends and allies uh, in sort of concentric circles around him in return for their loyalty and support. And that's sort of at the core of how Russia functions under Putin. And that has all sorts of effects, prevents Putin from properly reforming the military and so forth and so on. There's a lot of corruption in China too, but Xi Jinping doesn't rule primarily through corruption, right? He doesn't get his power primarily through distributing goodies. Uh, he gets his power from the institution that he is in, and that's the Chinese Communist Party. And that is still a real framework in a way that United Russia and, and Putin's sort of uh, political vehicles aren't. Uh, and, and so I think that uh, corruption is at the heart of the Russian regime in a way that it isn't in China. And that's actually a big plus for China because it means that China can safely reduce corruption without uh, challenging its regime's core function. 
Now, Min Pei would disagree with that. Min Pei would say, no, that elite exchange, it's key in China. And so that's why China can never curb corruption properly. Um, but I would say that's too pessimistic and it's too simplistic to say that that's the same as other authoritarian regimes. Okay, well, we have a question from Daniel Koss over in East Asian Studies. Um, and he says, I'm convinced by your argument that there are new constraints on corruption. But looking beyond Xi's campaign, might there not also be new fundamental incentives to engage in corruption? As the party interferes more actively in the economy and judicial courts offer less protection, bureaucrats' discretion becomes more important and therefore more valuable. Would bureaucrats with more discretionary power invite corruption? Um, interesting, yes. I think that's a great question. Certainly, discretion invites corruption. I think that is uh, a fundamental point that uh, corruption scholars have identified, and it's true in democracies and in authoritarian regimes, and it's definitely true in China. The thing that I see Xi's campaign trying to fix about that is that they're trying to let bureaucrats have much less discretion by creating institutions that have top down power and that create upward accountability mechanisms. So if we take, for example, the inspection system, the Xi administration has strengthened inspections so that they can descend on bureaucracies and descend on subnational governments in China and then not be accountable to them in any way, only be accountable upward and then try and then have enhanced powers to police them to make sure they're, they're not abusing their power over lower levels. So uh, this is the attempt by the anti-corruption effort to stop discretion. But if discretion is actually increasing, then yes, that would create huge opportunity for corruption. There are basically only two ways to fix the problem of discretionary power. One is with a rule of law based uh, bottom up system in which the public can monitor corruption and, and independent judicial um, and ju judicial prerogatives exist to check and prosecute corruption, and, and you have a democratic system functioning properly. And the other is what I call the authoritarian approach, which is an attempt to impose corruption control top down, to restrict discretion, not by making a bureaucrat accountable to the people, but by making them accountable upward. And so if that's not succeeding, then, then, then corruption will surely return. Okay, well, following on this, um, Jin Kai He from Harvard has a question about the propaganda strategy that accompanies the, the anti-corruption campaign. He says, to what extent does China invoke corruption in democracies, particularly in the United States, mm. in its domestic propaganda to boost support for its own anti-corruption campaign? Do you see discussions of the US being a safe harbor for corrupted officials or how corrupt Trump is in domestic discourse, such as Renmin Rebao? Oh, that's, that's a great question. Um, yes, I think there's a lot of research to be done on understanding the propaganda strategy that helps convince the public that this campaign is good and it's successful and other countries are doing it worse than us. And a big part of that is focused on the US. So definitely I see a lot of evidence that the Chinese Communist Party wants to set itself up comparatively to the US and to say the US is deeply corrupt. Now, the idea of US corruption has been a long theme in the Chinese Communist Party from the Mao era idea that democracy is bourgeois and it's a, it's a, it's a corrupt game of the capitalist elites to more recent discussions of how uh, US election finance is corrupt and that US democracy is a sham because it's just a, a game for the elites and the rich and the average Joe in America is being betrayed by his government. And so that, that is very, very common and it, it's, it's lost its old communist dimension, but it still is very much the propaganda strategy. And what I see is that since the 2016 election, that narrative has exploded or it's, it's increased exponentially. Um, Trump is uh, an indication of US corruption, this openly brash talking kind of uh, 
corrupt dealing figure, but Chinese propaganda focuses on how this is indicative of the system becoming corrupt and no longer being responsive to the people and therefore headed for permanent decline. It's part of this narrative that the US is headed for serious decline. So, so corruption remains very important, not just at home, but, but comparatively as well. Well, moving from these perceptions um, or portrayals of corruption, um, Fairbank Center affiliate Ran Shu asked a very good question. What do you think about how anti-corruption measures compare between authoritarian and de democratic regimes? Oh, a great, great question. Yes, I think um, overall, uh, several different kinds of evidence show that democracies are on average somewhat less corrupt, uh, but many democracies are deeply corrupt and have really serious problems with corruption, especially if they are poor, weak, or weakly institutionalized. Um, so those kinds of characteristics make democracies much more susceptible to corruption. Uh, but the corruption in democracies and authoritarian regimes is often quite different. So there is a tremendous amount of vote buying happening in corrupt democracies because that's where power is. It's still in the voters' hands. So you have to buy that power back from them. In authoritarian regimes, the most corrupt tend to be a highly personalistic systems where, like, like Putin's or like North Korea's where uh, money is distributed down and uh, people, and so actually money is distributed both up and down. So money is distributed by the autocrats to other elites. And then the public has to bribe officials to get anything they want. And uh, the whole system's infused with corruption in that way. Um, within authoritarian regimes, I think that's really the interesting thing. You know, among authoritarian regimes, I just said that the, the personalistic and highly authoritarian ones are the most corrupt, but there's also a group that's highly authoritarian and is able to curb corruption. And those are regimes like China's, I think, that, that combine in this interesting way, high authoritarianism with a strong uh, ability for reform and strong state capacity. And that's not just China, it's Singapore, like I mentioned earlier, to some extent it's Rwanda. Um, there are regimes in other regions, but, but a lot of these regimes are concentrated in East Asia, like the uh, former uh, Taiwanese regime under the KMT that, that combine what we think of as uh, contradictory characteristics. Uh, so uh, overall, democracy is less corrupt, but there's a lot of variation in both groups. And so what I wanted to do in my book is to explore within authoritarian regimes what's going on and variation there. Okay, well, continuing on this theme, um, uh, there's an interesting question from Shani Zhao from the Anthropology Department, mm. who thanks you for the fascinating talk and says that you mentioned current anti-corruption campaign is without mass mobilization. However, one phenomenon of the current campaign generates is an increase in whistleblowers among the masses, as well as all the mechanisms for people to report corruption. Um, what do you think of this? Is it comparable in any ways to um, earlier forms of mass mobilization? And also, is it effective? Oh, great, great question. Yes, um, I think that the, the Xi administration definitely wants to hear the voice of the people, but it doesn't want the people to have any power in exercising their voice. So it would like to get feedback in just the way you suggest, whistleblowers private citizens, not talking to anyone else, not mobilizing, not organizing, seeing something and saying something through the correct government channels, sending a message to an inspection team so that inspection team, for example, can take care of the, the corrupt official or can take care of the problem according to the party's rules and in the way it wants to without any accountability or feedback. So the party wants to benefit from the people's knowledge and the people's wisdom, but it doesn't want to give them power. And so in that sense, it's different than uh, what happened at some points in the Mao era where Mao really did want to give the people power, uh, where he really did want the people to rise up and to challenge uh, in groups, even their, their local officials. Um, so I think that that is an important distinction to make. Uh, it's sort of like Amazon now doesn't want 
its workers to unionize. Instead, it wants them to use the, the chat function to, to like mention any problems, but the chat function censors certain words like bathroom and, and uh, organizing or this job sucks, or that kind of thing. Um, so that, that distinction is key. And then does this work? I think it's certainly better than not listening to the people. I think that it's, it's good. And the more Chinese people believe they can use these functions, the, the better. Um, but I mean, fundamentally, a system without that kind of accountability is, is not as effective as a system with accountability. So the, the gold standard to, to curbing corruption is still empowering people to, to point out corruption and to organize against it. So many things in the U.S. or in, in, in more vibrant democracies would never have happened without people coming together and, and, and demanding it to happen. And, and uh, China is purposefully limiting its, its ability to receive that kind of criticism and that kind of feedback that could actually help its government. But it's quite striking that Chinese citizens don't limit themselves to these official channels um, uh, for protesting corruption or complaining about corrupt officials they've seen, because we know that that's one of the main reasons why Chinese protest um, against the government, go out into the streets to complain about it. And then also we've seen these huge mobilizations online of trying to expose and then mobilize popular support to do something about it. And um, so, so what do you think, how does that kind of sort of autonomous mobilization play into this? And, and do you think that's dangerous for the party? Oh, great question. Um, yes, I think that uh, over the 2000s, across the 2000s, uh, there was an increase in online mobilizing against corruption, as well as many other issues. But we saw student groups forming. We saw people identifying fancy watches that government leaders were wearing. And where, where, what, what is that watch? What, oh my gosh, that's a $3,000 watch. Um, and we saw these kinds of grassroots campaigns. And I think that that is exactly what scared uh, Xi Jinping and others in the party when they saw how the 2000s were playing out and how there was, in their view, excessive liberalism happening. Because this kind of bubbling up uh, seems to be positive if it can address corruption, but it always runs the risk of bubbling out of control, right? Uh, authoritarian anti-corruption has a natural limit, and that's the autocrat is never going to get himself for corruption. You know, he's never going to get his his uh, close friends or anyone he needs to stay in power for corruption. So there, there's that limitation there. And the Xi administration saw what was happening in the 2000s and increasing public protests against corruption as dangerous. And so as in the past, they moved to do a kind of two-step. One, address the problem, but two, don't let people keep talking about it. So, so they, they moved to put new restrictions on the internet and to put a stronger propaganda narrative into the internet about corruption. And that narrative that went with the campaign is that uh, the CCP needs to lead anti-corruption efforts and that we have a big campaign and we're handling it. And Xi Jinping is on the right side of anti-corruption in particular as a leader. Um, and then, and then to actually, you know, try to curb corruption. So, so it, it's, again, it's about taking power away from people. Uh, so while I might've been hopeful in the late 2000s that this could have bubbled over into something, I think Xi Jinping has seemingly successfully rolled back the past political liberalization that happened on the internet and in, in public in general under previous leaders. Okay. Jared, Jared Mazzanti has a good question here about your sources. Um, he says, in terms of evaluating the sex success of Xi Jinping's anti-corruption campaign, what non-official sources did you use to base your assessment on? It seems that domestic media sources would naturally praise the campaign for its success. And then obviously also government um, archives, government documents would probably do the same thing. So could you say a little bit more about the range of sources that you used? Absolutely. Yes. So um, there's definitely good reason to question all the government sources and, and non-government sources. But um, I use sources in a way that I think is uh, is fair to the sources. So for example, uh, I'm not going to read a propaganda piece saying Xi's campaign has uh, done a lot of good in this region. What I'm going to do is look for direct evidence of enforcement 
that has sometimes been verified by outside sources. So the, the official statistics say this many people have been arrested for corruption and this many mayors have been uh, prosecuted for corruption. Now, is that reflected in reality? Is that reflected in court documents in, in, the, in China? Is that reflected in the fact those mayors are actually gone? Did those mayors actually go to jail? Let's follow up on this. So I actually follow up on the evidence to make sure that there's a consistent line of evidence about what's happening. So even though China exaggerates things in its propaganda, it's not constructing this whole campaign as a fabrication. There is there really are a lot of arrests and prosecutions going on. And the numbers about those are verifiable by the fact that those people are no longer in those positions. Uh, so we can use that to triangulate and to show that enforcement has been broad ranging. Now, what about enforcement of rules? So for example, I mentioned the, uh, the eight point regulation, eight point uh, code that the Xi administration announced early on a- as an anti-corruption rule. Now, how do I assess that that anti-corruption rule has been followed? Well, first, I look at how many people have actually been arrested or or disciplined under that and look for confirming evidence of that. Uh, So that's combining propaganda with other statistics. And then I see that uh, that I I trace those numbers to see if they continue to be, uh, uh, that this rule continues to be enforced in later years. Because in many cases, an authoritarian regime will simply uh, launch a new rule and then not enforce it. But in this case, we can see that even 10 years out, there are still many people being arrested uh, for violations of this of this rule. And the things they're being arrested for doing happened many years ago, increasingly. So that combination of factors shows that probably the campaign actually is enforcing this rule. And it's not just uh, slacking off, nor is it just capturing continual corruption that continues to happen, but it's, 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 it's dragging back into past corruption. So the combination, a combination of this kind of uh, data analysis gets us closer to the, the hopeful conclusion that, that this is actually working. Um, I also look at economic data that shows that, that the outcomes of corruption have been apparent or of lessened corruption have been apparent in different fields. So we can see in the luxury market, that uh, many luxury goods are not being purchased at previous rates and the the pattern by which uh, luxury goods are being purchased is dramatically decreased. And people say, well, okay, but so that corruption could have gone somewhere else. But the thing is that we see a pattern of that across different economic studies. And here I'm drawing on secondary research that specialists have done in different industries. And when you see that pattern across all these different industries, across real estate, across car sales, across luxury goods, the restraint that officials are showing has increased in so many different areas that it's persuasive holistically that this has been a change of behavior because of the campaign in the right direction. And so so here's how I try to triangulate all these different things. Okay, well, we're running out of time. So we'll we'll end here with um, a provocative question. And uh, we didn't have a chance to get to all of these questions. So hopefully other people can email you um, with these questions and continue um, this conversation afterwards. But Yufei Du has a great question here about how the new mass surveillance technology that China is using is affecting Xi's anti-corruption strategies. Mm. Yes, I I definitely see a lot of congruities between the way that anti-corruption is carried out as a top-down centralized campaign and technology that supports top-down centralized surveillance, right? Uh, What she is trying to do is to solve the problem that is caused by too heavy or too too top-down a system, which is that Uh, It doesn't account for local variation and you can't really know the real situation on the ground. And so you're going to make mistakes and and the emperor's far away. And there are all sorts of problems caused by being too top down. But if surveillance technology, which is still being rolled out, can can really help the party get more precise information. And that precise information goes to uh, powerful inspection teams or anti-corruption agencies then it can definitely help the campaign. And it fits right in with the way the campaign is being waged. Uh, I'm not an expert on those technologies, but um, the way China uses other 
aspects of its state strength to to control people uh, con con further help its its anti corruption efforts because um, this top down control uh, controls government bureaucrats official uh, sort of economic behaviors and the behaviors that deal with money as well as like every other aspect of their lives. So as long as that doesn't lead to total paralysis, uh, top-down monitoring can be strengthened and can, can help the anti-corruption campaign. Yeah. Okay, even if it makes the job of a <laughs> communist- Yeah, even if it's pretty scary more to be working there. Difficult. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, thank you so much for a fascinating talk um, and uh, a lively discussion. And uh, I hope the book tour goes well. Thank you. And you sell a lot of books. <laughs> that's the, that's the plan. Millions and millions of books. No, it's a, uh, I should have written about you know uh, some some really juicy stuff. You know, Xi Jinping's Xi Jinping's personal corruption and his seventeen mistresses. That would have been the right strategy. But uh, well, right. that, that'll be the next book, right? Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you everyone for this great discussion. Thank you for all your questions and your attention. So uh, great. And I hope to be in Harvard uh, in person uh, later this year. Great. Thank you.